My name is Amy Sayward and I teach a variety of classes. My dad actually always teases me because I'm a diplomatic historian by training and daddy says the only thing I ever teach about is war. The reason he says that is because I teach courses on the Vietnam War and World War II. Now generally when folks think especially about the Vietnam War but also about World War II they think about the storming of the beaches in Normandy and they tend to think about them as part of American history but I really try to resituate them as part of global history because both were really very much global conflicts. So in my World War II class I spend equal time talking about those Anglo-American fronts in North Africa and then in Europe but I also spend an equal amount of time on the Eastern Front between the Soviet Union and Germany and then the American War in the Pacific. But it's interesting because when I first started to design this course I was so excited that I was going to get to spend an entire semester in World War II. But then by the time you talk about all these wars within the Great Big War and you talk about the social, economic, political, diplomatic <laughs> aspects, you don't actually have a lot of time to go into any one part in depth. So that's where the 12 to 15 page research paper comes in for my students. So the course really gives the overview of the entire war and then students spend the semester researching the particular area in great depth that they're most interested in. Now, my Vietnam War class doesn't have a 12 to 15 page research paper. That one, however, requires probably more reading than the World War II class because of course the Vietnam War is still very controversial. And so what I tell my students the first day is I'm not going to tell you what you're supposed to think about the Vietnam War. Your job is to figure out what you think about the war. But to come to an informed historical opinion you really have to read lots of primary sources, things written by the actual people making the decisions, witnessing things on the ground. And then you have to read what all of the historians have been talking about and arguing about for 30 years to actually come to that understanding. And the thing that in a lot of ways my students struggle with, they think about the Vietnam War very much as an American war. But it is a global conflict. In fact, Vietnam ends up being at the intersection of most of the most important things that are happening in the 20th century. They're part of the decolonization movement where countries are trying to become independent countries and cut their colonial ties. They're also very much part and parcel of the Second World War and then, of course, the Cold War. The United States probably wouldn't have fought in Vietnam if it hadn't been for the overarching Cold War. And then, of course, the end of the Cold War has a huge impact also on the Vietnam War. So I like to um, look at both of those conflicts very much as global conflicts, not as part of American history. And the other course that I really enjoy teaching, um, although my father says I only teach about war, the reality is I do have one course that's mostly about peace. And that's a global history topic um, course where I look at Mohandas Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Nelson Mandela. Because by focusing the class around those three key figures, students get to take what they already know or think they know about Martin Luther King Jr. and the American Civil Rights Movement and look at some of the origins of those thoughts and how they were applied first in India at the beginning of the 20th century and then in South Africa at the end of the 20th century. So by studying all three, they also can compare and contrast some really interesting aspects, the role of violence versus nonviolence, because the um, African National Congress in South Africa was not necessarily a nonviolent movement. They get to look at the role of uh, the contrast between a majority movement, for example, for Indian independence, versus the civil rights movement in the United States, which was a minority movement, very different dynamics about those. And they get to look at issues of race, which play out in all three of those conflicts. But in addition to putting that course in a global perspective, I always also teach it as an experiential learning class. So what I wanted, what I do in that class this past summer when I taught it, was I wanted all of the students to experience on some level some of the things that these men experienced. So we took a field trip to the maximum security prison in Nashville because all three of these men ended up spending some considerable amount of time in prison, dependent on which one. Some of them attended Sunday services at an African American church. Some went to a lecture and then to a yoga class. Some of them fasted. And then all of them had to participate in a grassroots socio-political movement. 
in part to realize how hard it is to get people organized towards one goal. Um, and at the end of the semester, they all wrote a reflection paper about the different experiences they had. And in some cases, those were some of the most meaningful things that they had. And it was funny, one of my students, um, he wrote about how he fasted for a whole day. And he was sitting down at the breakfast table um, with his family. And his daughter said, well, Daddy, why aren't you eating? And he said, well, I'm fasting. I'm purposely not eating any food. And she said, well, that's stupid. <laughs> and then he started to explain, he'd, um, one of the extra credit projects was to look at the women's suffrage movement and particularly the women who had fasted for the right to vote. So then he went on to explain to her about how women had done that so that she could vote when she grew up. So wonderful experiences like that are why um, I try to include an experiential component in this class. But you probably notice all three of my classes, I really focus on trying to take things that we think of as American history and to really round those out as global history and help my students explore those connections between what's familiar and what's less familiar.